Barb Wallace. I'm here with Donna Allward. And welcome to episode two of our Step Into the Story writing room. Uh, Donna and I, between us, have written over 100 books. We've sold over 3 million books worldwide. So what we did was create the writing room and is a way of paying it forward so we can help other aspiring writers uh, by giving them advice that we've learned over the years and help them by not maybe making making the mistakes we made and sure right. <laughs> we made a bunch. <laughs> Think of one, we probably made it. That's it. So we're going to try to shorten your publishing journey by helping you avoid them. Right? Today, Flatten the curve. <laughs> there, there <we> go. <laughs> Flatten the curve. Today we're going to talk about characterization because as everyone knows, the characters are the most important part of your story. More important than plot, theme, any of that, because if you don't have characters, you don't have a story. Right. Now, even I was going to say, I put it in my notes, even in a memoir, because you're the character in your memoir, too. So yeah. um, in order to make your characters as relatable and as appealing to the reader, you want to make them as three-dimensional as possible. How do you do that? We're going to tell you a couple ways. First way is called direct characterization, where you straight out tell the reader what they need to know. Um, a lot of times this is done if the book's first person or if you have an omniscient narrator where they know. Jimmy was a tall boy who grew up on the West Coast. That <laughs> sort of thing. Um, the danger with this is that you can end up info dumping, which yeah. is a huge mistake. Um, those who are not familiar with the term means you're going to relay all the information at one time. Yeah, and that's especially true with backstory, right? Yeah. So where the character comes from, what key moments define their lives and their personas so far. Um, and so then when you info dump, you actually end up um, perform performing two no-nos. So one is you end up telling instead of showing. And, you know, we talk a lot of the time about, you know, show, don't tell. Um, and then you also kill the pace of the story a bit because you'll have anywhere from a couple of paragraphs to a couple of pages of sort of dumping this backstory about the character. And then the reader has to like wade their way through all of their, everything that happened in the past so they can actually get back into the action with the actual story. So, I mean, a little bit of telling is fine and even necessary at times. Um, you just have to be careful that it's not going overboard. And I think the better technique is to really relay the information indirectly mm -hmm. and weave the bits and pieces of the story, or weave the bits and pieces into the story and letting the reader paint that picture themselves. So far, how do you indirectly reveal character? Well, let me get up our slides. <laughs> For starters, the key to ANTS is to remember the acronym. I apologize. I have a new mouse and it's not working real well. Um, to remember the acronym PARIS, P-A-R-I-S. I've heard it done other places where they've used the word pairs. I like Paris more because it just seems more visual and it's easy to remember. Like it's Paris. evocative. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not word. That's it. So Paris. So you're right. So let's take a look and break down what Paris means. All right. P stands for physical description, meaning what well, exactly what it sounds. You're going to describe your character. I am not a huge fan of head to toe descriptions. Yeah. Uh, there are authors who do a really great job at it. So I'm not going to say don't ever do it. There are people who can go into minute detail and make it sound fascinating. Yeah. Personally, I'm not that good at it. So what I like to do is hit on a handful of attributes and find the ones that match the, the character's personality. Um, like an example is in the book I'm in, uh, the book I'm working on, they describe someone as a giant teddy bear of a man. And I think you kind of get the image of what that is, a big guy who's squishy and soft. Yeah. Uh, a better example, I took this from Charles Dickens because he's one of the greatest. So let's just listen to what he does for description. The cold within him froze his features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Notice that he never says anything about the, how high his height, his eye color, his hair, his body shape, just a little bit of the body shape, but yeah. notice he doesn't get into details you know you don't hear he's got broad shoulders or thin shoulders or whatever but you knew i was describing scrooge 
And you right. knew what kind of man Scrooge was just from the choice words that he picked. Right. Um, but P also stands for, screw the mouse, <laughs> point of view. <laughs> right. When you're in your character's head, you want to describe things as they see them or as the other characters would see them. Right. Different people notice different details depending on who they are and what their personality is. For example, a woman is going to notice details about a house better than a man will or differently than a man will. Um, an insecure woman will notice different details than a confident woman. Yeah. Um, and what your character sees is a window into who they are, which is why rather than just doing a general physical description, going back to right. the first page, describe it through your character's eyes. Like what right. would your female protagonist or your male protagonist see when they looked at another person. Right. And when you end up describing a character when they're in their own point of view, so first person, like your character won't think about her own um, sky blue eyes or her alabaster skin or her cherry red lips. Like we just don't think of ourselves in those terms. So I wouldn't, for example, write, my eyes are sky blue, not an April sky, but the more steadfast blue of an October sky as the geese cut across it in a moving V. Like, wouldn't I sound so full of myself? <laughs> um, but this would work, however, if your point of view character is observing um, someone else's eyes, right? So if I'm, if your point of view character is looking at someone else, so if you change just simply the my of that sentence to her, it becomes her eyes are sky blue, not an April sky, but more. And then you're painting an image through that character's filter. Now, if I were in first person, I might say something like the air had a nip to it so that when I saw myself in the window, I had roses in my normally pale cheeks and my eyes were a bright blue made brighter by the cobalt stripes in my scarf, which is a little bit less poetic, but definitely gets the job done without it feeling like you know, without feeling like the author is intruding into it. So. Yeah. Um, in first person, a lot of times it works if you're doing a reflection, like the window or the mirror. You'll often see yeah. a scene where they're doing that. Otherwise, um, you end up, you're better off letting other characters drop in things or relate again, um, indirectly, like saying, he was six foot seven, which means I couldn't see past his belt buckle or whatever. Right. Um, right. So did you get you build it in that way. Or, you know, if someone says something like, like say you're out for a girl's night and one of the girls says, you know, oh my God, I really love your hair tonight. And then as a, the point of view character, you think, wow, I can't believe she said that because I really consider like my hair more of a dirty brown than anything that's attractive. You know what I mean? Like it just yeah. filters through that point of view rather than, rather than telling a description. So yeah, I'm like, I think it was a Joan where they said like, oh, you, I knew who you were. You look like your sister. And Joan immediately thinks, which was surprising because her sister was beautiful and she was short and squat. Right. Right. So would you immediately get a lot of information from that one sentence? Not just that her sister's beautiful and that she's short and squat, but that Joan harbors no illusions about what she looks like. Right. Yeah. Right. So then we move on to A, the A in Paris. So an A is for actions. So how do your characters move? How do they enter a room? Like, does he stride into the room or does your character shuffle? And this is where word choice can really be your friend because then you end up painting, word painting. And um, so rather than, do you remember the scene in Dead Poets Society where he says, um, you know, he's not sad, he's, and then one of the students goes, morose. Well, that kind of thing, but you have to be careful not to go to thesaurus crazy um, because you want your word cho choices to be enhanced and not distract. So, and also under the action heading is body language. And everyone has their own little, like when you're playing cards, your tell, or certain mannerisms when you're nervous or agitated or aroused. And so we often see things like characters biting lips, um, playing with their hair. I'm a hair player, so that uh, totally fits for me. Or tugging on their cuffs or, you know, running a hand under their tie. Um, I'm talking with my hands a lot today. Uh, a word of warning, though, you really need to use a light touch with these. 
you really don't want your protagonist, like if, if the biting lips is, is sort of your, your thing, you don't want them doing it in every scene or every chapter. You really only want to use it once or twice in a book, you know, maybe a few other times, but, you know, really be light with it. Because then it becomes, if you're not, it becomes a repetitive action. And then a reader will pick up on it and will be like, oh, my God, every time I turned around, she was biting her lips. That was a big joke about Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Anastasia bit her lip a lot. Anastasia bit her lip a lot. Like, hmm. Um, I had a book once where um, my character was always, you know, she'd get nervous or she'd get butterflies. So she'd press a hand to her belly. And my editor was like, she does this all the time. So, you know, I had to go through and, and adjust it so it wasn't a repetitive action as much. Indigestion? <laughs> yeah, right? She must, she, have, she must have just, oh, or cramps or something. I don't know. Anyway, I did it a lot, and my editor was like, no, no. Yeah, you got to so. make sure um, ticks and things like that need to be done with a very light hand. Yeah, because because readers will remember, so you don't have to, you know, hammer it in to them all the time that this is what they do. That's it. You know who's really good with word choice um, is Kim Taylor Blackmore. She wrote After Alice Fell. Yeah. And she is terrific about, and I know because I've taken some writing workshops with her, about finding a zillion different words to replace the one common one. Yeah. Because you, know, you always use sad. You always use walked. And she's like, pick a different word, one that fits the scene. You know, and you don't want to go overboard where you look like you're quoting a thesaurus where like every, you're constantly using all of them. But she's yep. very good at honing in on a word that's specific. Yep. So, so if you want a good, good read to see how someone does that. Kim Taylor Blackmore, after Alice yep. Fell. All right. R is for reactions, because as we all know, following every action, <laughs> yeah. reaction. <laughs> the way your character reacts will also reveal their personality. Um, I'm going to give you an example again from the book I'm working on. There is a party in my book where one of the characters has a massive drunken breakdown. Yeah. Uh, I'm, well, I'm sorry, but she does. And all the other characters are there. And one character reacts by rushing to her rescue. One character reacts by getting mad at her because he's ruined, she's ruining his party. Right. Another one is the voice of reason in telling everyone else, okay, don't rush. We don't want to crowd her. We're just going to get her upset. Don't, you know, let him handle it. Yeah. He kind of takes charge of the crowd. And another one's kind of sick to her stomach, like, oh, my God, I can't believe we let this build up. Yeah. Um, but they all react differently based on who they are. Yeah. So that not everyone doesn't have the same reaction. Right. Um, I was going to say another good example is um, in arguments. How, or how somebody reacts to criticism, for example, or yeah. how someone reacts to a, um, what do they flirt? Um, I'm, I'm losing track, but I was going to say one of my pet peeves is when characters act out of, act, out of personality. And you can tell right. when the scene is forced and you put in a reaction that has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, and that's quite often when it's the author wants something to happen, but the you know, and tries to shoehorn it in, but it's not right. true to the character. But the person, the character's personality will drive their reactions. So yeah. you can use their reactions to let someone know if to kind of subtly hint that someone's subtle is uh, stubborn, or yeah. always has to be right. Hmm. Yeah. Or has a sarcastic streak. How they react to a scene. Or avoid conflict. Or avoid conflict, right? <laughs> Um, how they, yeah, let's see. So basically, it's another little trick that you can use. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth trick, or fifth trick, I guess it would be. Yes. Inner thoughts. Inner thoughts. So nothing reveals a character's personality better than their thoughts. And that's, you know, the little judgments and observations that they make in their heads. And often this is done through deep point of view. So like really getting into um, their their feelings and their motivations and, you know, just getting really deep into that particular character and drilling down. But it's not always, sometimes, you know, you can use subtext and little things that um, you don't have to say a lot for it to really, you know, come to really help get the character across. So here's an example. And Barb wrote this example and it made me laugh. <laughs> so the example is, are you going to the tailgate party on Friday? Mary Lou asked. I can't, Betty replied. I have to work. Watching Law and Order SVU with her mom counted as work, right? 
She'd rather endure an SVU marathon than hang out with Mary Lou and her plastic-based friends. So just from those two, two sentences of thought, right? Like you already know that she's, she doesn't want to hang out with these people. She'd much rather watch TV with her mom. Um, and she considers these people, you know, plastic faced and, and fake. And, and so, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to say a lot for it to mean a lot. So you can tell a lot about a character by what's in their head. And it's a great way also to get your reader to relate to your character. And, you know, there's times I, I know the book I just finished, there were times when I found myself nodding, like with agreement, or if you have a villain or your character goes through something awful and it's traumatic, you know, you, you, uh, you kind of feel that same horror. So, so it's really, I would say that that internal um, dialogue or inner thoughts is really how we really get to know a character. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was thinking is, and I've seen tricks in it, um, where the character's thoughts reflect like their career or their chosen occupation as well. And it goes back right. again to the point of view thing um, where they're like, for example, you have a photographer, they're going to be very visual and they're the way they think are going to be thinking in terms of pictures and colors and images versus say a musician who's going to think very audibly. And right, um, you know, and make like your voice was grating, you know, or I'd rather not. I don't want to listen to her screech. You know, those right. So, but they're going to think the way their occupation or their personality or their right. person is going to be. Right. Yeah. All right. Which brings us to number two S. S. <laughs> number S. <laughs> <laughs> I know we, we usually number stuff, so that was just really cute. Yes, it brings us yes. to S in Paris. Speech. N I, and I use this as an example. My sister-in-law, a lovely woman. I don't want to say that she's not. She's a professional artist. And going back to the whole visual thing, she speaks like an artist. Her voice is got this lyrical cadence when you listen to her. She doesn't. I talk very straightforward, like a Yankee northerner. She. She kind of sings songs and she doesn't see green vegetables. She sees, oh, did you see these beautiful herbs? And they just, the voice just rolls off her tongue. Um, you can use someone's speech patterns to relay a lot of information. Like if you heard my sister, in sister in law speak, you would know that she lives in kind of a hippy dippy town and that she is a painter. Like you would just know listening to her, you wouldn't have to think too hard about when she said, oh, I'm an artist. She'd be like, of course you are. Yeah. Um, whereas like if you heard my husband speak, you would know within maybe 10 minutes that he's a numbers guy and everything's black and white. So you, like I said, you can use the way a person talks. You can use slang. You can use foreign phrases, although I would be careful with that because um most people don't use foreign phrases that they speak unless it's truly, right. um, truly like a, English is a second language. Right. I just finished Clark and Division by Naomi Hirahara. She dropped Japanese phrases in frequently and it's because her characters spoke English as a second language. Yeah. And she was using it to convey the culture more than anything. Yeah. And her parents spoke Japanese. So it was a great way to do it. Um, maybe they use a lot of big words and they misuse them. You know, trying to show off oh, acting. Oh, malapropisms. Like Those are fun. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good malaprop. There you go. I wouldn't have used the right word. But um, <laughs> I was just talking about that with someone the other day that they were talking about. Um, she, she, was, she said, you want to pay attention to how you're conceived. And she meant perceived. Right. And we're like, I don't think that's what you meant. So, but you could yeah. have a character misusing words, or they could um, give everyone a nickname, you know, hey, bud, or they yeah. could drop F-bombs every all the time. Yeah. That, um, um, that reminds me of in The Princess Bride, where it's like, I, that word, I do not think it means what you think it means, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, a good example is if you ever watched NCIS when they had Ziva on, she would use malapropism. Yes, all the time, and it was totally part of her character, and Tony right. would always give her crap for it. Exactly. And it was kind um, of... It became kind of their, actually, it became part of their sort of their rhythm with each other. Exactly. Right. But a word of caution, again, it's like ticks. 
you do not want to use it a ton. You want to sprinkle it through. Um, you know, the word, the rule of three or four is probably a good way to look at it. Like drop one or two in and, you know, drop one and act in. Yeah. Um, that's just enough to get the point across. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so S also stands for setting. And so there's two ways that setting can help reveal characters. So you can either have the surroundings match the personality or you can do the opposite and take your character and make them like a fish out of water and drop them into a setting um, and a contrasting environment and then watch them react. And then how well they adapt or how, or how they fail to adapt will reveal a lot about their character. So the, the example I picked for this and just because I've been reading it um, lately, but in Shirley Jump's Rescue Bay series, Greta, who is the grandma, she's a bourbon swilling, smart mouthed octogenarian in the golden years retirement home. And she's such a part of the scenery that it absolutely helps reveal who she is. And she's really a hoot. But if you took Greta and you put her in another setting, like let's put her in Manhattan, um, she'd react really differently. And, you know, perhaps she'd be less worried about the intentions of Harold Tuhig and more concerned with the traffic and the people and how a person can't hear themselves think in the city. And, and you know, it, it, she would be a very different person in that, in that setting. So, you know, you can, you can use that to either mirror or contrast, I guess, and help reveal your character. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about it in terms of like dropping a very, if you have a very sparse, a setting for whatever you know you're in a warehouse or wherever yeah. and the person that comes in is wearing fur and high heels that's going to say a lot about who she is as she showed up at a warehouse in fur and high heels and um pulling yeah. a full of the cane type of thing um yeah. so or you can another way is there was a writer who loved to do color like in the setting right to reflect like the person had a very fiery temper she was a very hot-headed person so she was always surrounded by something red um, you know, it, it was subtle, but you got, re it reminded you, you know, she was sitting in a red chair or standing in front of a red velvet curtain and, um, which was better than having the red hair, Irish fiery temper. They never said right. she had a fiery temper. She just was right. always in some area where it was either really hot or really red and it was bright red. So it would always come across. Yeah. And it it was like subtextual, but still Very. brought in so that it, it creates that atmosphere, right? Now, so that's Paris, P-A-R-I-S. <laughs> Obviously, we just did broad strokes. Um, we yeah. can do an entire workshop on each letter. Um, two workshops for P and S. And yeah. We'd be glad to do it. Maybe that's something if you want to see it, we'll do it in 2023. Uh, there is plenty more to cover on all of this. Uh, so we would be glad to do it. In the meantime, I do have three books that I would recommend, and I don't know if Donna has any more, but I was going to recommend Writing Unforgettable yep. Characters by James Scott Bell, Character and Viewpoint by Orson Scott Card, and Writing Compelling Fiction by our friend Shirley Jump. Yep. Those three, if you, they will give you a handle on doing a lot of showing versus telling. Okay. I have heard there's also a book by Janice Hardy called Show Not Tell that's supposed to be pretty good. I've never read it, so I can't um, say one way or the other, but... Yep. Any kind of book that tells you how to show, not tell, will give you these tips. I think, too, um, I, as we were talking, I thought of, um, and we were talking about word choice and um, just varying it up. And so I was thinking um, any of the thesauruses, thesauri, um, by Angela Ackerman, but like the um, the emotional thesaurus, and I know there's a bunch of other ones, but, but any of that series can really help you sort of Thumb through and make sure that you're using a word that is um, appropriate to to um, the situation, but varies it up so you're not always using the same word to describe things or, or whatever. So um, I think I would recommend that. Okay. So, oh, you know which one I would recommend that I totally forgot about? It's called the Describer's Dictionary, which oh. examples from literature on one side and then gives you words to use on the other, but it's a great... Oh, neat. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think I have it in my office somewhere, but it's a great way to read how other people used description to reveal people's characters, especially, yeah. for, and especially for physical description. It's fantastic for that. Um, or for setting. It uses those two or it's mm -hmm. a great resource. So it's called the descriptors dictionary. Yep. And then um, I guess another one would be um, 
Verbalize or Activate by Damon Swade. Oh, yeah. It works the same, the same way. So um, any of those. Yeah, there you go. We recommend it. So I guess that kind of wraps it up for this month's writing room. It does. So um, to our viewers, if you like what you saw, um, please subscribe to our Step Into the Story on YouTube so you don't miss any of our other broadcasts as well. So we have reviews and we have um, uh, fun interviews. We do our deep dive into a book every month. So um, please follow us there. And then if you haven't already, join our Facebook community, which is at www.facebook.com slash groups slash step into the story. And I think our next one is on November 15th. Is that right, Barb? Um, when we're doing a deep dive into Kelly Rimmer's The German Wife. And all the links that Donna just listed, you can also, if you go to our website, which is stepintothestorybooks.com, you can click on the links there and go directly. Yep, to absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back next month after Kelly Rimmer with another writing room. I think we're um, we're going to have a couple more before the end of the year. If you have anything specific you'd like us to address, please drop us a line at uh, any of our any of our sites. And we'll be glad to hear what you have to say. And hopefully we can accommodate you. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Have a great day.